okay, is to uh, do, you click up here, you do new, and you choose active object class, okay? And for that active object class, under its name, I'd like you to choose person, okay? Um, uh, and you could, in general, put a, a description, which would be good modeling practice. But after you've done that, you should see over on the left-hand side here, in this hierarchy associated with the project, what you have is a, um, a, a set of uh, uh, an additional person uh, class that's shown in addition to the main class that was shown before. Now, this person class is not yet a, an agent. This is what well, is going to be an agent, but it's not yet an agent. To turn into an agent, what you have to do is go to the general tab down the lower right and click on agent, okay? And you'll notice as I do that, I'm gonna click and unclick it. You'll notice on the screen there, it's changing the icon associated with the person in that model hierarchy area. Do you see that? Um, so, so when it's an agent, it shows it in sort of a Da Vincian sort of motif um, <laughs> of, of sort of the, you know, the, the Da Vinci thing, the measure of man. Um, and, and indeed that, that looks like, um, it has bare some resemblance. Um, uh, so, so that's our, our agent. It's a depiction of our agents. And um, regrettably, that's the logo that's used even if it's a deer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, th there, there's our, yeah, that's right. Um, so uh, you'll notice that it, it changed the icon. Okay, another thing you'll notice once we did that is that there's a, there's a star here next to the, um, uh, next to the uh, project name. And that's an indication that this is, has, model has unsaved elements. Okay, so uh, under the general um, exhortation, save early, save often, um, I'm going to save it and you'll notice that star goes away. Okay. Um, we couldn't do that last time because it was a sample model we were modifying and we couldn't save it um, because it didn't want us to stomp on its own models. Okay, um, so we saw last time the various subdivisions of this window. Um, uh, the project window in the upper left here showing a hierarchy of modeling elements. The problem window indicating issues with the model and warnings. Um, the canvas window um, up here, a properties window, uh, and then a set of a palette, or palettes, uh, which um, by which we can add elements to the um, to the canvas. Okay, um, all these windows can be enabled uh, under the view menu. Um, so if they're missing, you can add them in. Okay, um, so uh, just as a as a warning. Um, Sometimes uh, there's a variety of windows that are, that are minimized and uh, uh, you may not see them. You can actually use, um, uh, if, if you see something like this, like your palette has disappeared, you can hover over it. It will show, show what it is. Okay, so let's focus on some of the uh, elements here in the projects window. So the project window uh, depicts a set of uh, components for this model. So the first is what's called the main class. Uh, and this class defines a stage under, under which agents are gonna circulate. It could be one population of agents, it could be three populations of agents, it could be populations, multiple populations of the same agent or different sets of agents. But basically this is the um, environment that defines the global environment. It's also gonna define the local environments, the, the patchwork that in which agents move, et cetera or the, the place where a network's gonna live in which agents circulate. Um, there's then uh, an agent class. Right now we have one. We could have persons and, you know, uh, persons and deer. We could have uh, persons and doctors or what have you. Uh, persons and cities if we had a multi-scale model. And then we have an experiment class, um, which, which allows us to define assumptions and run models. So um, so these are all components, and I'll t give a sense of, of what's meant by class in a minute here. Um, normally for main, there's just one instance of this running at a given time. So when you're running the model, there's, there's one main, um, uh, one stage on which the agents struck. And um, 
This is going to contain the collections of the other classes. Agents are associated with your particular um, agent types of interest. And typically, there's many instances, particularly that you have many, many agents circulating, even though there's only one agent class. And the agent class you'll be defining, in this case, person, is going to define agenthood, sort of personhood or personness. What are the characteristics of a person? What are the behaviors of that person? So uh, what are their various attributes in terms of their state, the things that evolve over time in terms of the parameters about them, and in terms of their behavior? And then finally, the experiment class is defining these scenarios, um, which we can change. OK. Um, now, these classes, and indeed the, uh, the simulation, uh, so the experiments, can be associated with visual representations. Okay? And these representations, I argued last time, are particularly useful in an agent-based modeling context because they give us a clear sense of agent behavior. Visualizations are key for recognizing these sort of emergent patterns, patterns that we may then wish to cross-check against patterns in the world through the systems that we're familiar with. Um, so what I'd like you to do is double click on the person class, okay? So over on the left hand side there's, uh, there's person and if it's not already open it will appear. In this case it probably is already open on the right hand side unless you've been futzing. Um, so you double click on it over there, it will open it. Um, I should mention just um, by way of passing if you want to see this in a more fulsome way you can do so by double clicking on it and it will actually show a full screen version of this, which um, you, you may wish to, to focus on, and then you do double clicking on it again, it goes back. This is, anyone recognize this interface? This interface is widely used in computer science in another context. This is using what's called Eclipse. Eclipse is the number one um, software development environment for Java programming, and uh, any logic is built to top of Eclipse. Um, so uh, uh, that's notable because it does allow you to afford to make use of the Eclipse debugger, et cetera, which is uh, something we'll mention at some point. Okay, so how, here we have a person defined, it, and we have various properties of person. Um, okay, so I mentioned the agent class defines what it means to be, so a person class defines what it means to be a person within our models, in terms of parameters, in terms of state, and of behavior. Um, and indeed, in terms of appearance, what do they look like when they're running? What, what sort of uh, visual representation do they have? Okay. Um, and a given class here, a person class, will typically have many representatives. So there'll be many persons circulating. It could be just zero. There could be one or zero. But for the most part, we'll typically have a population of agents that are, that are circulating. Um, and you may have several types of agents, so pairs and links, uh, patients and doctors, etc. cetera. Um, they'll all live within this space, excuse me, ooh, over here, okay? Um, so what is a class here? A class is like a mold under which we cast these objects. It defines that personhood, and we can make, like a mold, we can make many particular casts, many things in it. Um, and, and uh, have a mold of a cookie and have many cookies come out of it, so it is with a, a, a person class. We can use it just like a cookie cutter to create many particular persons within our model. And those persons could be heterogeneous or they could be homogeneous. Pretty much the same, the same operation. Um, they're all going to have some variation perhaps, but they share certain salient characteristics that are defined by that personhood. Um, so they'll have certain shared properties, certain properties in common, even though the values associated with those properties may be different. So they may have a sex, age, and ethnicity um, val variables associated with them, variables and parameters. Even though they differ in the particular values used, this may be a male, uh, male uh, Asian of age 26, and this may be a you know a 43 year old uh, female Caucasian. Um, they're both they're both persons. They differ in the, the values used uh, in the particular values associated with those variables, but they share that same set of attributes and the same sets of behaviors. 
So this is lingo drawn from object-oriented programming. Um, and it, using this lingo, we, we define the class at development time, but we get many objects from it at what's called runtime. When the model's actually executing, we have many instances, many particular, as it were, copies, uh, particular persons associated who have this who, who have this characteristic of personhood. Um, now classes provide an implementation um, of this interface. It, it allows them to run at runtime, and we'll 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 see some some aspects of that. So we're going to distinguish here between what we see in the model when we're building it up versus what we see when we're actually running it. Okay. Um, and it's kind of important to be clear in this distinction. So what things we're kind of specifying uh, at design time and what things are actually set when, when it's actually running. Um, and this is similar to the distinction between you know, the recipe itself and then actually putting the recipe into practice, actually doing the cooking, right? Um, so uh, with cookie cutter, that's the analogous to our class. And then when we're actually doing the cooking, we'll use that cookie cutter many times to produce many particular cookies. Those are our, our particular agents that are circulating. One cookie cutter yields multiple agents. Okay? Um, so uh, uh, our agent is class is defined uh, you know, at development time. The multiple agents, that's just like the multiple cookies. That's when we're actually doing the cooking or running the model. Okay. Um, Okay, so any logic makes use of a hierarchy of classes, and some of you will be much more familiar with this than others. And in fact, if you look in the any logic documentation, there's an extremely rich software development library associated with these classes. Okay, that we're going to actually tap into from time to time. But basically, each of these classes is associated with some appearance, a de the design time interface, what it looks like at design time. And then runtime elements, which are sort of what's around when it's actually running, okay? And we're, we'll see how these interact uh, in a little example here in just a moment. Okay, um, so uh, design time components, we're going to be declaring things like variables, parameters, functions associated with this class, defining the visual elements for the class. And those visual elements may be replicated when the agent's actually running. So what, what's a single line when we're defining it visually may become multiple lines when it's actually running. Okay? Um, a circle that we define when we're defining it, uh, defining the class may get located at many points on the screen when it's actually running. Okay? Um, so uh, what we're going to do here is we're going to now build up the visual representation of a person. And we're going to enrich this over time with additional attributes, uh, uh, though probably in the, next, in the next class. We're going to see how we can add heterogeneity into here. OK, so what I'd like you to do is you have person open here. And if you scroll up and left a bit, you should see a kind of crosshairs there. And in fact, it's in this version of AnyLogic, it's shown right away. That's what's called the origin. Okay, you'll notice down, in, down here um, in the lower right, if I move my mouse over this, it's showing kind of my location. And you'll notice the location 0, 0 is, is actually right at those crosshairs, okay? Um, having trouble reaching it. But um, uh, what we're going to do is we're actually going to add in an oval, okay? So to find that, we have to go over and find on the palette what thing is relevant. Well, it's a presentation that's of relevance. So make sure this presentation tab is, is clicked so it opens up. And you're going to see an oval. And what I'd like you to do is to take that and drag it over. And um, it appears before us in, in blue. Now, this is a rather large oval. And I'd like you to shrink it down until it's, it's much smaller, maybe a radius of 1. And I can do that with this, um, this sort of thing here. And oh, man, it's kind of scrolling off there. Um, it's actually easier in the other, or the earlier version. Um, fine, and it's getting kind of warped in a weird way, but hey, there we go. Um, and then I'll drag it there, okay? Um, I'm putting it at the origin as a point of reference. It's actually not totally key that it be there, but um, uh, it allows us 
precision in how to locate objects later on the screen if it's at the origin. Okay, so uh, anyone having issues with that? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have this object there, and don't sweat it too much if it's if it exhibits um, asymmetry. It's it's not a big deal. Um, okay, so uh, what I'd like you to do now is um, is go and double click on main. Okay. So double click on the main class. And you will see before you a palette or a canvas for the main class, which is currently empty. It has that origin as well on it, but currently there's, there ain't nothing else there. Um, so uh, this is the stage in which agents will strut. This is the stage in which agents will circulate one or more populations of agents. And um, it's going to define the, the interface to the whole model as well. Um, this is going to be going to capture the environments in which agents circulate, both global and, and local, okay? So we're going to have populations of agents, call them replicated, replicated agents. They're, we, they're basic persons, but they're replicated a certain number of times. That doesn't mean they're all the same. They may differ in their values, but they're all persons, okay? Um, so now we're going to add persons into the main class, okay? Um, and what we're going to do to do that is we're going to drag from the agent class over here onto the main class, the, the, the um, canvas associated with the main class. So see this person? I'm going to click on that, and I'm going to drag it over here and drop it. Okay? And it's going to propose naming it person. But I think that's misleading because it's actually going to be a set of people. So I'm going to say population. Okay? You could call it persons, you could call it people. I, I prefer population, okay? Um, okay, so what we're going to be doing is setting a replication property. We're gonna set the number of agents associated with this population, okay? We're then gonna add in an environment that's gonna give us some assumptions about the context in which these individuals are circulating. Are they in a spatial context? Are they in a network context? Are they in both? We're going to be able to, to set that with what's called the environment. And we're going to see how that can be used. We're going to further be able to define statistics on these agents. So those statistics will count up things. So you're associated with those observer processes I talked about. It might count the number of agents with certain attributes, for example, certain characteristics, the number of infectious agents, the number of agents who are currently alive overall, what have you. Okay? So, um, uh, we're going to uh, now set the number of replications. Now, th this version of any logic that we see here, I believe it's uh, uh, slightly, uh, slightly uh, different. We're going to need to say replicated, and it's going to have uh, initial number of objects. We're going to say 100, OK? You'll, you'll notice that it was a little bit different in this earlier version here. So. Uh, You'll, you'll put 100 there, and you make, make sure that a replicate is checked. If it's not checked, you can't fill anything in there. Um, OK. OK. You'll notice that there's a uh, field for environment here, but uh, we'll leave that, uh, leave that uh, blank for the moment. OK. Now, one thing I'd like to point out here, does anyone notice anything? So when we drag this in, that, that got put there. That's our representation of our population. You'll notice the dot, dot. That's an indication that there's more than one of these persons there. Um, within this population, it's a so-called replicated population. It's a population of a number of agents, OK? But there's something else that happened when we did that visually to the screen, something that's different. What is, how is this different from before we dragged that thing, other than this little icon itself? What else has appeared there? The circle, yeah. That circle, where'd that come from, do you think? Yeah, it was the circle associated with the agent class. So what this is saying is basically, hey, you're going to have some depiction of agents on here. And it's kind of a reminder of that. We're going to have some agents within this shown within this main class. That's an added thing to the depiction of the main class that we've gotten by having this population of agents, OK? Um, Okay, so um, we're going to come back to this in just a minute, but 
I want to now go to the experiment class. So I'd like you to, to, to click on the experiment class over here, the simulation here. And um, this allows you to define and to run, indeed, scenarios uh, where you question assumptions um, about the model. And um, you can set a variety of important things here. The time horizon for a simulation. How long do you want to run it? How much memory do you want to give to the simulation? Um, do you want it to be really frugal or a large amount? Um, you want to, you can set whether it's running with the same so-called random number seed, which will lead to the same particular sequences of values over times, or the different one every time. Um, and there's some advanced things called virtual machine ar arguments that are useful for debugging, etc. Um, notably, um, you can set the parameters um, in this parameters field, you can actually set parameters for the whole model. Right now, the model doesn't have any parameters, so there's nothing to be set there, but we'll see how that's used, okay? Now, um, what I'd like you to do is to run this model. So I'd like you to right-click this guy and do run, okay? Um, and what you'll see is something quite uninspiring. Um, this will come up, and you click on that, and you see before you a little model and in fact, it's running. Do you see time is running down here? So if you don't see time, you can click over here and you can choose model time as we did last time. But basically, time is running up. But this is singularly uninteresting. There's a depiction of agents. And what I'll tell you is all those agents, those 100 agents, live at the same place. And that's why their representation is all shown in the upper right. We haven't told them where their home is. And so they're all crowding into that one place, all overlapped. Oh, okay. There's a hundred of them. And in fact, if we click, ladies and gentlemen, if we click over here, what you'll notice is there's a hundred agents. And you can actually click on that. You can scroll through the different agents. But they're all singularly boring agents right now. Um, there, there's, there ain't nothing of interest there. But we can actually drill down and, and, um, and poke around. And that will become much more interesting when we've heterogeneity. So what I'd like you to do now is we're going to give these agents a home. We're going to find them a home, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and uh, uh, what we're going to do is to, oh, yeah, I should have shown you um, how you could pan around it. We'll have to try to do that later. OK, so agent populations here are living in this main class. And through the replication property, the number of agents can be set. That 100 that I put in there is in fact a Java expression. We could put in a variable there, and it could be, it could be something which is you know dependent on user input, what have you. Okay, we're gonna now focus on the environment property. Okay, um, so we're gonna associate uh, this main class with an environment. And then in general, there can be many environments. We're gonna just have one right now, and that environment is gonna say something about the context, the the context in which these agents live. Okay, so let's go do this. So we're going to go find an environment. Where can we find an environment over here? Well, it's in our palette somewhere. And in fact, it's under general tab. Okay. Um, you click on general, and there's an environment there. Do people see it? OK. So I'd like you to drag over. Boom. OK, you can leave its name um, as environment. And this environment is going to have uh, some features which are of interest to us, most notably in the advanced tab, okay? The advanced tab is, um, is going to uh, let, us, um, let us set some, some properties of the environment. Uh, right now, we are going to, uh, to, to not set that for the moment. What we'll instead do is we'll go back to population and tell it to use the environment, okay? We'll say environment here. Um, so, so in other words, we're telling it, for its environment, use this thing we call the environment. Now, speaking of odd icons, the environment icon has an odd resemblance to Barney the dinosaur. Um, but uh, try not to be distracted by that. Um, uh, what's that? <laughs> Yeah, I think it's actually a depiction of the Atlantic Ocean with a stylized representation of Africa, but it's, it's an odd. I'm afraid you permanently altered my view. 
Okay, so in environment, you'll notice there's actually a little, a little thing here uh, next to it, which is a little, uh, little light bulb. Um, and uh, in general, that will clue us in to things that we can, um, uh, we can accomplish uh, uh, within these areas. So it's giving us some hints. And what this is saying is actually, in this little area, if you use the word index, um, that's, that's the person number. Um, so we can have different persons associated with different environments um, just by giving a different expression here. Okay. Um, so what I'd like you to do now, though, is to uh, run this model. And uh, let's go, go down here, and we'll run it. And again, we should see this. But we should see people now having some heterogeneity, spatial heterogeneity. They're spread out over the environment, right? That location was set by the environment. Um, it was set by their default properties in the environment. OK, so um, you'll notice that if by default, the environment, I've gone back to the environment, it's set to use a continuous 2D environment with a certain width, a certain height, and um, we simply made use of that property. OK. Um, so behind the scenes here, what's going on when we change something here and when we run the models is what's called a build that's going on. It's, it's built the model and turned it into a form that can be run. And when we run it, it, it makes use of the results uh, of that build to actually execute it. And there's a tool called a compiler that, that does that heavy work of turning it into an executable form so that we can run it. And it, the reason it's worth noting this is because it may complain sometimes. And it may complain down in the, uh, in the problems window. So for example, if I went back to population here and I misspelled environment, instead of environment, I said environment or something along those lines. Um, and I tried to run this model it would then uh, end up having a complaint. It'll say, OK, error exists. Do I want to run it? And I say, no. And you'll see down here in the problems window, it says environment cannot be, cannot be resolved. So I'm going to go back, and I'm going to turn it into environment. OK. And at this point, I should be able to run it again. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, you can. You can actually distribute these models as applets um, for use over the web or as standalone things on the desktop. And uh, it's readily done. It, it turns out that affords you some extra flexibility as well um, in terms of uh, uh, observing things that are going on within the model, instrumenting the model to record certain types of information. So it has some deep implications, OK? Um, OK, so now I'd like you to open up the canvas for person. And what we're going to do, um, I should have, sorry, I should have had this slide uh, later. We actually keep it on main, double click on main so we could stay there because we're first going to do something involving main. We're going to place the agents in a network, okay? So we're going to have three steps to do this. First, we want to tell the environment that we want to, the environment that we want to have these agents in a certain type of network, namely a distance-based network. It turns out, as we'll discuss in uh, one or two lectures on networks within this class, there's several sorts of networks that have garnered research interest. Um, there's a very interesting class of, of uh, scale invariant networks that exhibit what are called power law distributions called scale-free networks. There's a very simple sort of network uh, variously called a Poisson random network or an Erdos random graph. That's another type of network that exhibits uh, very global properties. There's small world networks that exhibit some global, some local properties. Um, we're here going to make use of a distance-based network. And what that network means is we're going to have two people connected if they're within a certain distance of each other, otherwise not connected. So we're going to take advantage of their spatial locations and only connect them if they're within a certain distance, OK? So you can imagine this reflecting perhaps um, 
transmission of a pathogen, a local phenomenon, where two people have to be within a certain distance to, to communicate that pathogen, right? Okay, so we're first going to set up this environment to do that. Then we're going to specify the attributes of the network. In this case, it's a single attribute, how far people can be affected by each other or be connected. Um, within what range they're connected, they're considered connected. And then finally, we're going to give agents a way of appearing visually connected. In other words, having connections to each other that are very visible as a network structure. Okay? So these are our three things that we're going to do now. Now, this has, connect this has visual implications, but it turns out it's going to be important for us as well when we simulate spread of ideas or pathogens across the network. So this is not merely eye candy. This is something which, which has import uh, computationally. Okay, so let us begin, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, so the first thing we have to do is we have to go to main, which we get by, again, double-clicking on main in case it's not already open, and then we're going to click on environment, okay? And under environment, we're going to pick a network type down here, and you're going to have to scroll down, but it's a distance-based network, okay? So that's under network type, okay? Um, so you're going to have to pull down this and do... And then for connection range, uh, you should you can leave it as 50, okay? So again, what we're setting is we're saying, hey, consider people connected if they're within 50 spatial units of one another and they're not connected otherwise, okay? Um, Okay, so we've, we've accomplished the first of these things. Second thing we're going to do is we're going to place them in the network. Um, and in fact, we've already done that by saying, okay, this population has this environment as its environment. And we've said, okay, we're gonna use a distance-based network. We've already associated them with the network. So there's nothing more we have to do. The final thing, and this is gonna be a little bit more involved, in fact, it's going to be a lot more involved. We have to give the agents a way of appearing visually connected. In other words, showing connections between them. Okay, so this is going to lead to an illustration of some of the things I was talking about, about the difference between build time and run time in terms of the appearances and in terms of uh, uh, sort of what's associated with, uh, with uh, the class and what's associated with objects that are instances of the class. So what I'd like you to do is we're going to add a line to connect people. So right now, if we were to run this model, um, and I'll run it. Hey, I'll run it via a different way up here. I'm going to show you a different way to run it. So you can click here and just choose which one you want to run. I'm just going to run this. And you remember, this is what we have. This is helpful for showing where people live, but it's not helpful for showing who's connected with who. I would tell you that below this, people are connected to each other. It's just not showing it. It doesn't know how to show it who's connected with who right now. They are connected, it's just there's no depiction of it, okay? So we need to add this depiction. And the way we're gonna do it, the way we're gonna add this visualization is we are going to augment the representation, the visual representation of a person to have an additional element, which is a line, okay? So I'd like you to go double click on person, and I'd like you to add in a line here. So you have to go over here to the palette and add in presentation, and you'll notice there's a line. And what I'd like you to do, ladies and gentlemen, is I'd like you to drag this line over so that the, you place it squarely in the middle of that circle. That, that's a strange English expression, um, but so it is. Um, uh, I'd like you to place it directly in the middle of that circle, okay? Um, so you dragged over and released it right in the middle of that circle. And you'll notice um, that the circle, this line actually has a kind of asymmetry. That on one side, the side that was associated with the mouse, it has a little plus, and the other side it's a little dot. Turns out that's important because the line is directional. It, it matters which way it's going. But okay. Um, so, so the plus should be right in the middle of the circle. If it's not, if it somehow led, ended up somewhere else, put it so that its plus is right in the middle. Okay? Okay. So there we go. Um, uh, okay, so now run the model. And now we get what appears to be 
a field of lollipops. Um, so, well, okay. Is there, is the, I don't know if those are lollipop yet. Um, but uh, it's kind of, kind of as that geometry. Um, okay, so uh, this this is a step, but it it's not taking us all the way we, we need to go. Instead, we have to. So what do we have to do? I mean, um, uh, to go from this this depiction to what we actually want, what are we going to have to do? So suppose. Um, Suppose we focus on this agent, and let's suppose the radius of connection is something like this. So, so you know, this agent is connected with these three. What do we have to do to to change about this for it to appear in a network visually? Okay. So that's right. So this line here from this agent, we actually want it to be connected with that agent. We want another line to this agent, another line to that agent, right? And so we need, in fact, not just one, but three lines. And they have to go to the appropriate neighborhood. Right? Uh, so that's what we're going to do here. Um, now, this is a, this is a procedure that um, you rarely have to do. Um, you have to write code for it kind of one time per model. It's a little bit involved, but we're going to see how it's done. OK, so right now there's only one line per agent. We need one line per connection, right? And we need those lines to connect the appropriate people. Um, okay, so I'm just going to show some some features of of any logic. So what I'd like you to do here is we still should have person open, and we click on that line, and you go to properties. Okay, and what you'll notice is there's a tab called dynamic. Okay, so right now this appears by to be simply a line. We want it, ladies and gentlemen, to not merely be one static line. We want it to actually become a set of lines, a replicated set of lines. So we go up to replication here. These are various properties of the line that we can set. Um, so we could actually set properties uh, in here for this. These are, these are expressions which we can set which will change which will by which the properties of this line will change. Um, for example, this x here and y give the location of that x and y uh, of that line in x and y. This dx and dy tell what's the delta x, delta y associated with the line. This gives the line color. And these can be expressions. These can be expressions. So, you know, if we wanted all lines to be a single unit over and a single unit up. We could set that with one. Don't do this yourself, I'd say, but um, you know, here the lines are really tiny. They're so tiny you can barely see them. If on the other hand, we had set that to other values. Um, okay, come on. Uh, we're going to dynamic here. We could have set it to 100 and 100, and what we'd get is a line which is at a 45 degree angle and as has 100 uh, over 100 down. We can also set these to be general expressions. So so these are these are Java expressions. I could set dx for example to be the current time. And I could run this now. This is a property of the line and it's going to end up evaluating that over time. <laughs> and You'll notice what's going on here. Um, as time rises, the dx rises. So these properties can be specified um, to be dynamic quantities. They're not merely fixed things about this line. And one of those properties, ladies and gentlemen, I'm just going to clear this up. Um, one of these properties is replication. That property is the number of copies of that line we want. And how many copies of the line we want? Well, we want the number of agents to which they're connected. So I'm going to put in something that I'm going to explain in a separate context. But we need to find out how many people to how many people this agent is connected. I told you behind the scenes it's already connected. We're just trying to depict it. Trying to depict it with these lines. And I want to ask the agent, hey, 
How many people are you connected to? How many connections do you have? I want to ask, if I'm the agent, I want to ask myself. Hey, how many people are you connected to? So in order to ask this question of the agent, how many people are you connected to? I give the agent his name. The agent's name is this. Me. Hey, hey, myself, how many people are you connected to? And I do this dot get connections number. Okay? Um, now that's a long thing to type. And it's easy to make mistakes, particularly when you're jet lagged and it's late. Um, so it's easier actually to, to start typing it and do control space. And it will actually propose a number of things here. And it'll basically fill out potential potential uh, ways you could complete it. So I did this dot get connections number. On a Mac, I think it's command space. Maybe command J, but I think it's command space. In any case, um, that's the replication. So what this is saying is, hey, whatever number of connections you have, make that the number of line, copies of the lines you have, OK? Um, so that's one thing we did. So basically, that means each line, for each person, they're going to have a number of lines that depend on the number of people to whom they are connected. OK, well, that's, that's a good start. The other thing we have to do, though, is point to the correct person. OK, so um, the next thing we're going to do is to, um, yeah, I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, OK, hey, come on. Where, where, is, where is this appropriate slides? Um, what the heck? Um, okay, here we go. Um, right. I think I'll come back to these things. Okay. Um, okay. So there's there was only one line per agent, but uh, we we added one line. You know, we made it uh, one line per connection. Now what we're going to do is need to have that line go to that other person. We're going to have to have it go to in space the person to which it's connected. So to do that, I'm going to have to adjust the dx and dy. DX is specifying how long is the line, or what's the what's the sort of uh, displacement of the other end of the line from its origin. If it needs to go over to the right, it will be positive. If it needs to go left, it will be negative. And similarly for dy, up and down. I think down is positive, etc. So if we have some index agent and we have some other agent to which it's connected. This is a position this, this is a position that. It has to go over by the difference. The dx is xb minus xa, and then dy is yb minus, that should be ya, not ysa. Um, so what we're going to have to do here is to put in a little bit of code for this. Okay. So um, agents here are what we call objects. And to get a reference to the current agent, to sort of say, hey, me, how many, who's your neighbor, or what have you, I use this term this. Okay? Um, if we have a reference, we can then request information from it by calling a so-called method on it, a so-called function. Okay? Um, so what we're going to have to do is, to get our neighbor, we're going to have to ask, hey, for myself, this, get my connected agent, get connected agent. And if I, this i, if it's 0, it will be my very first agent with whom I'm connected. If it's 1, it will be the second agent with whom I'm connected, the third, et cetera. OK? So, and then if we want to get the x or y position, we could call get x or get y. So this is going to be very new for those who are, or, who are we're going to put these pieces together. And we're going to put together a little expression here. So our location, if, if we're the person known as this, this is me. My location is, I should say, uh, me, um, I think it should be get x and get y, not x and y. That's a, that's a typo there. Um, get x and get y. Um, so that's my x and y coordinate. And this 
is the x and y coordinate, oops, get y, of my neighbor. Um, so this is neighbor zero. This will be this dot get connected agent of zero dot get x. And so this is saying, hey, for me, this, get my neighbor who's at not agent, say neighbor number index, and then get their x location. This is me, get my neighbor number index and get their y location. That's their position for them. So if we want to connect it, if we want to go over by that displacement, xb minus xa, this is xb and this is xa, so we need to subtract. The, we just want to have the, the difference between the two. It has to go over by the difference between the two. So if this is at 1 and this is at 2, it has to go over by 1, 2 minus 1. Okay, so we're going to insert some code to do that. And this is the code that we're going to use right there. And it's reflecting that logic. So in dx, this, this is the page that we, the, the, the displacement associated with this line, we have to have this dot, that's me, get my connected agent of the index, of, of the index associated with this other person to whom I'm connected, dot get x, that's the x for that person minus my get x, this dot get x, my own location. That's for dx, and for dy it's the same thing, except it's get y for each of them instead of get x. Okay? Where did this index come from? Where did that index come from? Why am I using index there? Well, it turns out, if you go down to this, this is a little light bulb, and it tells you index index gives the index number of the replicated line. So it says, what's the, what's the number of the line with which you're currently setting the dx value here? Okay, so I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say this dot get connections, uh, get connected agent, get connected agent, um, and then I have to give it index because that's defined to be the index of the current line. If I have three lines, um, for the first line, this will be zero. For the second line, this will be one. For the second line, it will be two. And then I have to say get x. That will be, so for me, for the, my connected agent and its x position minus this dot get x, my own position. And I'm gonna copy that for get y as well, okay? Again, you may find it easy to, to use this, this autocomplete control space. It will fill things in, but you need, to, you need to type enough that it can prompt you meaningfully, okay? So in any case, um, what we have is that expression there. So have people typed that yet? Okay. So what, what I'd like you to do now is to run this. To be clear, we now have replicated this line by the number of times needed, the number of, number of uh, agents with whom we're in contact. And for each of those copies of the line, we have it going at the right angle to the appropriate person. So here we go. And now we have a network depicted before us. Uh, and in fact, if we were to go drill down now, what we can see is where each person lives and to whom, you know, how many connections they have. So we see uh, different individuals have different numbers of connections, um, different individuals. We could then pop up to the next level by clicking, clicking up. So now we have agents. We have those agents located in an app. Okay. Yes. So this is actually creating two lines. Correct. So, so. Let's, let's uh, think about it. So this agent here, um, within the radius to which they're connected, there's four other agents, right? So there's, if we consider this agent, let's focus on this agent, within that, the area to which they're connected, that radius of 50, there's this one, this one, this one, and this one. What was a single line when we designed this class, in other words, when we define the class, 
what we saw visually was a single line here in any logic, right? That has become several lines. It's become four lines. Four lines? Well, that's exactly what we told it to do, right? Okay, let me stop this. Um, but that's exactly what we told it to do it, with this little snippet of code, replication. We told, hey, make that many copies of the line here. As many copies as we need to connect to our, to our neighboring agents, get connections number. That's what that means. And if you looked it up in the AnyLogic manual, that's how you find how many connections I have in the network. Okay, and then for each of those lines, each of those lines is going to have these properties. It's kind of an X location, a Y location, a thing to do on click. It's going to have an amount that goes over, an amount that goes down. And for a given one of these replicated lines, a given one of these lines that's copied, it, it's dx properties can be given by this expression with the proviso that index here is that number of that agent. Okay? Index here, index there. So this is about as complex as it gets in terms of kind of setting up a model visually. Um, uh, but what this illustrates is that you have these properties you have uh, these properties that can be dynamic in nature. They can have expressions, not just constants associated with them. Y you will have visual elements as well as non-visual elements like parameters associated with agents. And those, um, those uh, visual things can be replicated. They, they, they can exist uh, at runtime in a way that goes beyond their visual representation. This shows a line at 45 degrees, but as we know, at runtime, we can have multiple lines, not just one, and each of them can be at a different angle as set by these expre this expression here. So questions about this before I leave you with just a glimpse of what we're going to be doing next time to create a heterogeneous population. This is messy stuff, but this is about the worst you'll see for the semester in terms of reasoning for that sort of code. Yeah. I just, uh, if you know what you want in your head but don't know that it's called get connected yeah. agent, the control space thing is helpful, but you have no idea what it's called. Yeah. Where do you go? So you would go to help and uh, you do any logic help here. And, uh, what I would do there is search within the any logic for, um, you know, uh, something like um, uh, number of connections or something like that. Um, and, and you'll see it says, you know, agent connections and you know, say, okay, get connections returns a list, get connections number returns the number, that sort of stuff. Great. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, also search online and uh, uh, th th there's a, an additional um, set of tutorials which can clue you in. Um, okay, I'd like to though, this, this is a little bit on the graphics, you know, depiction side, which I argue is, is again, important for many things, but I want to wanna focus on uh, one important aspect, which is, look, if we're modeling things, in addition to how it appears, we want to think about, we want to think about uh, characteristics, right? Um, uh, how are we going to depict those? Well, if we double click on person, well, it's probably still open here. Um, and we go up to general. What you'll notice is there are these things called parameters, okay? Um, and for parameters, we could actually add them in to a model to, to depict uh, characteristics of the agent. So I'm going to take this parameter over here from the palette. I'm going to drag it in, and I'm going to name it something like income, okay? Um, and now our agents have associated with them not merely a visual representation, but some sort of data associated with, with income. Now, because this is a parameter, we can actually specify it associated with the population. So double click on main now, okay? And then where is the population of agents here? So 
I, I mentioned Maine is the stage in, on which the agents strut. Wh where is the population of agents here? Where does it live? Well, okay, the environment is setting the context for them. It, it situates them. But the actual population is where? It's right in a thing called population. Um, so if you click on that, <laughs> if you click on population, um, what you'll see is that we have now a field, not only called environment, but also, and not only this replicated thing, but a thing that says income. Do you see that? And in fact, if you go and you look at the parameters tab, you'll see the thing there. So first of all, I'm going to say, um, I'm going to make its, its income, I don't know, say 50,000. Um, and we could run it. And what we'll see is that we now have agents who are all paying $50,000, presumably per year, not per month. Um, and uh, <laughs> not in that population. Um, uh, OK, so how would we see that? Well, we'll notice uh, what I just did is I went and I drilled down here. And you'll notice it says its income is 50000 If I scroll around, OK, the other guy's income is 50000 or other gals. OK, so let's, 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 let's actually have it vary. So we're going back to Maine. We have this population. Ladies and gentlemen, this could be an expression. It doesn't have to be a constant. So we could have uniform, uniform between, well, let's suppose, and you notice, you notice, Chris, when you're kind of doing this, per your question, there's, there's documentation that pops up here. And so I'm going to actually do this one. Um, uniform, it says generates a sample of the uniform distribution, the interval 0 to so-called argument, the, the, um, the values that I give to it. So I'm going to say it's uniform between 0 and uh, you know 100,000, something like that. Um, obviously not realistic, um, but there's, I believe, dozens of these expressions custom distributions, triangular distributions, normal, log normal, Poisson, Bernoulli, um, you know, a wide variety of different uh, distributions from which to draw. And, uh, Is there any way to yeah, so sorry? Is there any way to error yeah, certain things are checked. Uh, it's a great question. Certain things are checked automatically. Lots of errors that are going to be caught before runtime. And there's certain class of errors that are not going to be caught, caught yeah, before. Yeah, can, yeah, yes, yes, there is. Oh, yeah. So there's, there's a thing called build, which I'll show you in just a second, OK, um, to do that. So now I'm going to run this. And what do you think will happen now? There'll be a distribution. So now what we have, if we go here and we, we click down to the population, you'll see this one has a, has a um, income of 59,000. But you click up and um, and uh, let me, you notice 22, 71, 60, 96, et cetera. Um, so what we, what we have here is actually a, a heterogeneous population. But that, what we're going to do now, um, and, and this is kind of a reward for your patience, um, is I'm going to double click on main, click on that circle, OK? And we're going to have the radius of that circle depend on the income. Okay, so we're going to have this be income divided by, by let's say um, uh, five thousand dollars. I'm actually not quite sure of the scale. I'm just trying to think here. Um, say by two thousand dollars. Okay, um, and I'll, I'll set the radius y to be the same as radius x. Right. You could have them depend on different things. One could depend on education. One could depend on income. You know, but if we do that, what do you think we'll see? So, yeah, exactly, exactly. So distribution of sizes here. Um, so there's going to be some with low income, some with high income. Now, the gets even more interesting that because now income could be varying over time, and if you had income varying over time, it will actually 
pulse and you know vary it dynamically in the representation it will automatically be updating the visual representation to reflect the current income. Uh, so, for example, um, we could have uh, aging going on, and we could size them according to income and age, and as they aged, it might, it might grow. Um, I won't depict that right now, but uh, suffice it to say uh, that, that you could quite readily uh, uh, quite readily have it be on a dynamic attribute. So that's a glimpse of uh, heterogeneity. I want to distinguish this, the ease of doing this, from what would be required in an aggregate model where you have it subscripted, disaggregated by income. We divide into categories. First of all, this is a continuous quantity, right? We can keep this specified to whatever level of precision we want. We don't have to simply divide it up into quartiles or divide it up into, into uh, quintiles or divide it up into deciles. We can keep this to whatever degree of specificity we want. And secondly, if we wish to add a new attribute, suppose we want to add age or suppose we want to add sex or ethnicity or suppose we wanted to add um, someone's education level, it's literally a matter of sort of going and adding a parameter to this agent. It wouldn't affect other things in the model. It wouldn't affect other agents in their definition. In an aggregate model, if you want to subscript suddenly by age or by sex, you have to modify all the stocks, all the variables, all the flows. So it's actually much more of a global changed model structure, whereas here it's a very localized change, and one that actually has a lot less impact on runtime. So anyway, um, I've. Uh, Exhausted, uh, exhausted the time, but uh, what we've seen here is about as involved as it gets coding-wise for the basics of agents. And if you could bear with that, um, I think you'll you'll find the rest of the uh, the presentations and little examples fairly straightforward. Um, I would request that um, those folks who are sitting in the course as guests consider doing the assignment because it will reinforce these skills that we've used here. We've, we've sort of prototyped some of the skills you'll need to do that assignment. But um, uh, if you do the assignment, I think you'll feel more confident in this. And we're going to build on this to start investigating uh, models where we have uh, a variety of dynamics, where we use state charts, where we have agents communicating and agents moving, et cetera. So thanks very much. Um, uh, have a good weekend, and I will be seeing you next Wednesday for um, uh, further, um, further work, particularly with state charts and agent evolution. Thanks very much. Um, sure. When I do the controls, there's nothing shows up. Is it because I'm using the evaluation use? I mean, I, I think I understand the wrong oh, okay. version. Okay, no, no, no. It's because... Um, Something else taken this. It's it's because uh, here, um, so you're in Maine, right? Um, I, anywhere, I mean. Okay. Yeah, but let's let's go. Okay, okay. let's let's go. Let's oh, go. Oh. Sorry. See, because yeah. control space for me is uh, to switch between language. Oh, oh, so okay. So I have to cancel that to be able to get that, right? That's yeah, I think that's probably it. Um, okay, that's that's. Okay, so some of the other key bindings work. Um, I, I just requested something else, and that's okay. working. So I don't think it's a problem with any logic. I think it's a problem with, okay. with interaction with yeah. this. And maybe you can assign that to a different key. Yeah. Um, to I, see if I can solve yeah, I mean, it's conceivable that in preferences here, you could set keys. Ah, there you go. So code completion, you can set it if you want. Okay. To be a different thing, like I don't know, maybe you want it to be um, control. Yeah, or something like that. Yeah. I I don't know. I guess. Oh, oh, oh. Let's see. I control all. There we yeah. go. Um. Or uh. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, that's good. Um. I don't know if it will list. Let's let's try control alt space. Okay. Okay. Um. Let's just try this, and then do uh dot um uh, oh. uh control space. Yeah. Um. Control Alt Space. Uh, oh, so yeah. it does work. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, okay. I don't need Good to install really the okay. university version. I mean, I can I use the evaluation use only version? Uh, you could. The problem is, that I think it may expire after a certain amount of time. Okay. That's so, um, no, but then 
it'll probably